Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to God's house today as we gather here to worship him and to hear his word. So glad that you're here. So glad that uh, those that are at home are also here with us as we, again, rejoice in Christ's victory, which also means our victory, our victory for eternal life uh, with him in heaven. May God bless us as we hear that word this morning. The service that we'll be following this morning is printed out for you in the service program. It is a, a service of word and prayer. Uh, the hymns, uh, one of the hymns uh, split into two parts, so these will be sung either from the service program or from the red hymnals. Uh, the other hymns are, are new hymns from the new hymnal uh, printed in the service program. This morning we focus on how joy marches victorious over, over trouble or over circumstances. May God bless us in that joy despite whatever circumstances we experience each day. We begin our worship with the opening hymn. It is hymn number 377. Dear Christians, one and all, rejoice. At this time, we'll sing verses 1 through 5. May God bless our worship. <laughs> on page two of the service program. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. I rejoice with those who said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. 
How lovely is your dwelling place, Lord Almighty. Bless her. The Lord is near to all who call on him. To all who call on him in truth. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us. So that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus was delivered over to death for our sins. And was raised to life for our justification. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Thanks be to God. He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Dear friends, let us approach God with the true heart and confess our sins, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to forgive us. Lord of life, I confess that I am by nature dead in sin, for faithless worry and selfish pride, for sins of habit and sins of choice, for the evil I have done and the good I have failed to do, you should pass me away from your presence forever. O oh Lord, I am sorry for my sins. Forgive me for Jesus' sake. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. In his great mercy, God made us alive in Christ even when we were dead in our sins. Therefore, as a servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Blessed Lord, you have given us your holy scriptures for our learning. May we so hear them, read, learn, and take them to heart that being strengthened and comforted by your holy word, we may cling to the blessed hope of everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. We continue our service with the Psalm of the Day, this is Psalm number 65, and this morning we'll sing a hymn version of it on page four, a hymn version called, Every Heart Its Tribute Pays. Yeah. 
Let us now give our attention to the chosen scripture readings for this day, the sixth Sunday of the Easter season, a Sunday in which we continue the general theme of the, of the Easter season of victorious, Christ victorious over sin, death, Satan, Christ victorious for us, and this morning's special emphasis, uh, because Christ is victorious, also then the joy that he gives and has secured for us is victorious over the difficult circumstances that we experience in daily life. The first reading is from the book of Acts, chapter 14, beginning at verse 8, whereas uh, the, the apostles, as the witnesses of Christ's resurrection, uh, joy and ministry were unaffected by the difficult circumstances that they were experiencing. In Lystra, there was a man who was sitting down because he had no strength in his feet. He had never walked because he was lame from birth. When he was listening to Paul as he was speaking, Paul looked at him closely and saw that he had faith so that he could be healed. Paul said in a loud voice, stand up on your feet. And the man jumped up and began to walk. When the crowd saw what Paul had done, they raised their voices saying in the Lyconian language, the gods have come down to us in human form. Barnabas they called Zeus, and Paul they called Hermes because he was the main speaker. The priest of Zeus, whose temple was just outside the city, brought bowls and garlands to the city gates because he wanted to offer sacrifices along with the crowds. But when the apostles Paul and Barnabas heard about this, they tore their clothes and rushed into the crowd, shouting, Man, why are you doing these things? We too are men with the same nature as you. We are preaching the good news to you so that you turn from these worthless things to the living God who made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and everything in them. In past generations, he allowed all the nations to go their own ways. Yet he did not leave himself without testimony of the good he does. He gives you rain from heaven and crops in their seasons. He fills you with food and fills your hearts with gladness. Even though they said these things, they had a hard time stopping the crowds from sacrificing to them. Then some Jews came from Antioch and Iconium and persuaded the crowds to stone Paul. When they, when they thought he was dead, they dragged him out of the city. But after the disciples had gathered around him, he stood up and went into the city. The next day, he left with Barnabas for Derby. After they preached the good news in that city and had gathered many disciples, they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples and encouraging them to continue in the faith. They told them, we must go through many troubles on our way to the kingdom of God. Next reading is from the Gospel of John, chapter 16, beginning at verse 16. Jesus promised the disciples and, and also promises us that we will experience grief and sadness and we'll wonder you know, where Jesus is, but that grief and sadness will be turned to perfect, complete joy in him. And remember that Jesus said these things uh, not too long before he was crucified. So strengthen the disciples for that experience. Jesus said, in a little while, you are not going to see me anymore. And again, in a little while, you will see me because I'm going away to the Father. Therefore, some of his disciples asked one another, what does he mean when he tells us, in a little while, you're not going to see me. And again, in a little while, you will see me. And because I am going away to the Father. So they kept asking, what does he mean by a little while? We don't understand what he's saying. Jesus knew that they wanted to ask him about this, so he said to them, are you trying to determine with one another what I meant by saying, in a little, in a little while you are not going to see me, and again in a little while you will see me? Amen, amen, I tell you, you will weep and wail, but the world will rejoice. You will become sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn to joy. A woman giving birth has pain because her time has come. 
But when she has delivered the child, she no longer remembers the anguish because of her joy that a person has been born into the world. So you also have sorrow now, but I will see you again. Your heart will rejoice and no one will take your joy away from you. In that day, you will not ask me anything. Amen, amen, I tell you. Whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. Until now, you have not asked for anything in my name. Ask, and you will receive, so that your joy may be made complete. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Thanks be to God. We continue with the second half of hymn 377, Your Christians One and All Rejoice. And as you notice in singing the first five verses, it's really the, the account of, of us, our sin and need for a savior, God sending his son Jesus as savior and then Jesus carrying that out. And so we continue that account of Jesus as our savior and our joy in him with verses six through 10. <laughs> Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father, with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, it's kind of exciting to move, move to a, a new state, a new town, a new home. 
Although you might say that the move is not so exciting, but the, the prospect of moving is getting ready for it. Picking out a, a new home, choosing a new city, a new state, getting away from one set of circumstances that maybe aren't so great or, or maybe are, but looking forward to maybe better circumstances. Maybe a different crime rate, yeah, of course, you can mention that, or different political atmosphere, uh, different schools, a different school district, or maybe just better flooring, or maybe even a, a really nice front door and front yard. You know how attractive it is when you, if you look at homes uh, online. Boy, that home looks really front. The curb appeal is, is really great. That looks really like a great home. And then, of course, you look at other things, schools, uh, community, offerings of what, what there are, climate, everything else. And okay, yeah, the, the, the front curb, the front door looks great, but yeah, maybe not so for the rest of the community and state around you. Well, whether or not it's exciting to move, and uh, some of you maybe are considering that prospect, or maybe recently have, and oh, I don't want to move. Or, yeah, you know, it's maybe time to move. Well, keep that all in mind uh, as we take a look at the third reading for today from Re Revelation chapter 21. So very near the end of the Bible, second to last chapter of the Bible, and we're given a picture of our new home. Whether you are looking for a new home or, or feel and your circumstances lead you to say, well, I'd really like to, to get to someplace better um, or not. Um, it is a, a vision, an, an imagery of the new home that Jesus is preparing for you and for me and for all believers. So truly it is a, it is your new home, my new home. And just as we'd want to check things out ahead of time um, through the, really the whole letter of, of the whole writing of Revelation of St. John, we're given a, a vision, a picture, an image of what that new home of heaven is. And so as we look forward to that new home and, and what it's like, you know, sometimes the details are really hard to wrap our heads and our minds, our experience around we get a little bit of an idea of what a glorious place Jesus is preparing for us. And therefore, what a glorious status we have before God that he has called us to be his followers, his children, and has done everything necessary to make us disciples, to make us children of God, to make us his brothers and sisters, to open the door to an eternity with him. And so, as we are given a little bit of that new home and image of it, he lifts our hearts. He keeps us thinking heavenward. He keeps us thinking, I'm but a stranger here. Heaven is my home. And that is helpful. That is helpful for sometimes when we really, really feel like we're strangers here. We're really glad that heaven is our home. Or, or when we're glad where we are now, this description of our eternal heavenly home is so great that it lifts us to say, boy, even though things are great here, they'll be so great in heaven that I'll be happy to move when God says it's time to move. So here are the words in Revelation 21, uh, verses 21 through 27, and they, they pick up on a, a description of heaven, a imagery. Uh, John was given this vision of heaven, and, and the wording is, uh, a lot of it is symbolic. Uh, a lot of it may be, may be very liberal, literal. Uh, we're, we're not really quite sure, but most of it points out to us that things are so wonderful that we can't even imagine uh, how great they are. And so it begins right in with uh, a description of our heavenly home, and the city, the holy city that it's in, the holy Jerusalem, it says the 12 gates, and so the 12 gates of the city are 12 pearls. Imagine that. 
Each of the gates is made out of one pearl, and the street of the city is pure gold, like transparent glass. I did not see a temple in the city, because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, because the glory of God has given it light, and the Lamb is its lamp. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. There is no day when its gates will be shut, for there will be no night in that place. They will bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it. Nothing that is unclean and no one who does what is detestable or who tells lies will ever enter it, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. This is God's word. So a short little tour of your new home and my new home, where the great joy we have now will soon be made perfect and complete. And so the front door, the gate to the city, really, the city that will be our, our heavenly home, Pearl, gates of pearl. How beautiful, how wonderful, how, how pure, how, how incredible, how could that be, right? And so the, the gates of the city, um, um, each gate made out of one pearl, I think we can only just imagine that. I'm not sure how, how an architect or a structural engineer or a builder would put that together, but... Of course, God can do that. Just imagine that, walking up to your uh, front door of the, of the, the city, the, en- the gate, the entrance to your new city or your new house and the, the new home and the, the door made of pearl. It probably would say to you, and it should say to you and to me that, wow, this is going to be beyond any extravagance, any joy, any excitement, anything we can even imagine. Even if we have a really nice entrance to our city or a really nice door on our front door, maybe the, the nicest door in the neighborhood, uh, the nicest door we could put up, it's, it's so far beyond that that all we can say is, wow, what a beautiful place God has prepared for us. And the street of the city is pure gold, like transparent glass. Not just a layer of gold, not just painted gold, but pure gold. If you think about what our experiences here are on earth, they're, they're of course, completely the opposite of that. Why are there even gates or doors on homes and things? Is because while well, there needs we need to they need to be there to be a separation between us and the, the outside. Why does there need to maybe why do we want to put a really nice front door uh, on our house or paint it a, a beautiful color? Because well maybe so that kind of gives the impression to people that you know the house is a really nice house. Or what is our experience with, with the streets in front of the house or the streets of our city? We, here we, every 10, 15, 20 years, um, you know, we got to repave them, fix the potholes, paint the lines again, clean them, you know, weekly. Our experience is anything but that, but Think of those experiences of our life here on earth and, and all the, the heartache and the trouble and the, the garbage and other stuff that goes along with streets and cities and in our own lives that will all be gone. Streets of gold, gates of pearl, glorious. I did not see a temple in the city because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. So in other words, there, there's not going to be a church there. We have 
one of the things that we probably do when we think about moving to a new area, a new city, a new state, is, is to look ahead, you know, where, where is there a, a church that we could go to, a church that's faithful to God's word? You know, generally we'd say a Lutheran church like our church that teaches the same way that we do and believes what we do. As so you look ahead and go, yeah, okay, there's a, there's a, a good church you know, nearby, that'll be good. And that, that becomes a big part of our, our decision. And why do we want that? We should want that. We're glad when there's a church nearby because gathering in church means we're gathering in God's house, we're gathering with fellow believers, we're gathering in God's presence. And, and we have a need for being close to God, close in, in faith as faith connects us to God and, and close to him and hearing his word, his mercy. Close to him, praising and thanking him for his grace and blessing and forgiveness. And so we, on this earth, we, we have a need for that, to, to draw close to God and for him to draw close to us. And so Christians set up temples, churches to do that. The Bible times, the, the Old Testament times, that's what the temple was for, for, for the people of God to meet with God. And that's really the same purpose of a church building for people of God to meet with God, to be close to him and he to us. So what does that mean, that there won't be a temple in the city or there won't be a church? It really means that there won't be a need for that because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb, Jesus, are the temple. They're there, and we're there with them. So a description of the the closeness that will then always be there eternally in heaven. The closeness to God and he to us. And that'll be continuous. How wonderful that'll be. How wonderful that there won't need to be a church. We won't need to go to church because that's where we will always be. Near to God and him to us. And not just near in Sense, senses of it or, or near in faith or near because his word is being spoken to us, but near because we are really near. Physically near, spiritually, emotionally, everything. Right there before God, with God, forever. Look forward to that. That you'll never have to be again uh, thinking about Okay, we got to get to church, or we got to keep the church, you know, going and running, or or if the church is too far away, that's that's affecting my, my faith, my worship life, or or even a wondering, I, God doesn't seem near. My life is is there's troubles and, and hardships or setbacks, and and it just doesn't seem like God is near to me or I to Him. Uh, that we know and understand and experience. And that will all be gone forever. Near to God and him near to you and me forever. That sounds like a great place to, to live, doesn't it? The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it because the glory of God has given it light and the lamb it's, is its lamp. That sounds a little bit, bit strange. Um, but if you think about uh, what we need, you know, in life here we you know the sun shines you know daytime but then you know evenings and nights we, we need different sources of light and sometimes that can be be hard to find different places of the world maybe hard to secure the energy needed to keep the lights burning uh, at night or other troubles that interfere with that or or Sometimes and usually it's, the sun is shining too bright, it's too hot, or, or it's too cold. It's not shining enough and it's too cold. I recognize that myself, that we think, oh, I wish it'd be warmer. Oh, no, it's too hot. You know, it should be cooler. And uh, how often we have reasons to complain about the weather or to complain about the level of lighting. Or complain about the electric bill. <laughs> that is all a part of that. That's our experiences here. In heaven, that won't even be part of anything we need to think about. Day, night, too hot, too cold, 
too bright, not bright enough, too expensive, the Lord's glory and, and what that will look like, we don't quite know, but his glory will provide the light and it will always be daytime. And, and not, not daytime in the sense, oh, it's a long day, I'm going to get tired, but you know, the middle of the day, the, the perfect part of the day that we just love and wish that moment could just be all day long and, and go on forever, it will be like that. Boy, that sounds like a a great home, a great place to live, a, a great climate there forever. Yeah. Second part of that, that description, the nations will walk by its light and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. Sometimes the phrase, you know, to walk by something means to, to describe our you know, life of how, how we live or our life of faith. When we, we walk in the way of the Lord, that means we're, we're living in faith, going God's way. And so it also points out that you know how in our lives here as we think about day and night and, and electrical bills and all of that and so much you know, angst over you know, you know, who's getting the, the power and who's making money off of it and, and where are the energy supplies coming from. You know, that's been a lot in the news recently, of course, as maybe as it always has been. And we then think about others taking advantage of the energy supply or, or this or that and and other nations going to war against other nations over energy and all the issues that are caused by people being at war individually or as group by group, community by community, nation by nation, that too will all be gone. So just as God says in the other part of Revelation, uh, to gather around the throne will be uh, those from every nation, tribe, language, and people. All the pe nations, people from all the nations, they won't be competing, they won't be, be trying to take from others, but those brought their home to heaven will all be united in this city, this state, this home. Not looking, what can we get in, what can what glory can we we get for ourselves in our life for our for our nation but rather glory underneath or subservient to God's glory God receiving all the glory and then sharing beaming all the glory upon us so any experience that comes to mind when nations go against nations says will always be the case on this earth. That will be gone forever. What a great home Jesus is preparing for us. There is no day when it, there is no day when its gates will be shut, for there will be no night there in that place. They will bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it. Earlier, I guess, kings here, the here is mentioned the nations. Huh? You know, why do you lock your door at night? Why do you have a door in your house? Why is a, a neighborhood gated? Why in ancient times did they have a, a city wall with a gate that was closed at night? To keep out the evil, to keep out the trouble, to keep out the, the bad stuff or the bad people or, or a invading army or a criminal. Uh, you think about how much of our life experience is all about that security, all about protecting ourselves, our families, our belongings. Yeah, we all remember back in the old days in the Midwest or small towns, you didn't have to have a door in your house or, or at least lock it. You didn't have to do all that. And it really, things probably weren't quite as wonderful as we thought they were. Difficult in other ways. But imagine life, not having to think about that. I lock the door, I set the alarm, I remember my keys, you know, I need to check around the property. None of that ever again. There will be no need to have a gate because there will, and no need to have a door because there will be no evil there. No attempt or desire of someone to harm someone else. 
How wonderful a peace that will be. Talk about sleeping <laughs> peacefully at night, not having to wonder, what was that sound? <laughs> Did you lock the door? Did you lock the car? No, having to look at what's the camera, security camera showing. No, having to scan the, the, the neighborhood report, the police, the police scanner, and wonder what's going on. I hope people are safe. No. We're not even hearing sirens anymore, as we, we know so well in this part of town. Perfect. No reason for a gate to be closed because there will be no night there and everything that comes with the night. That sounds like the perfect town, the perfect state, the perfect place to live, the perfect neighborhood that Jesus is preparing for you and for me. Nothing is that is unclean and no one who does what is detestable or who tells lies will ever enter it, but only those who are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Now, first, we hear that go, good, finally, finally to get away from all of this stuff on earth that, that is detestable, what we see on the news, what we, we experience, finally to get to a place where there is no more of that. But then, it's like, oh, wait a minute, or who tells lies? Oh, who will be there? Will this eternal heavenly home be for you and for me? Have, have you ever told a lie? Have you wanted to tell a lie? Have you ever thought a lie and, and maybe tried to make it not sound like a lie? Um, anybody who hasn't, please raise your hand. Maybe some of you younger ones haven't done that yet. No, you have. Well, the very last part of the reading is... Jesus' answer about whose home this is and who it is for. And it is not for those who have never told a lie or never sinned. It is for those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. It is for those that Jesus has made his own, has washed clean of lies and detestableness by, by his blood who's covered over with, with his righteousness, who has changed us, changed us from being liars to being his holy, dearly loved children, holy, dearly loved brothers and sisters, part of his family, and therefore heirs, inheritors, ones who have a claim on this home, this heavenly home. Not because we lied a little bit less than the rest of the people out there, but because Jesus has taken away those lies by his death on the cross. Not because we're just a little bit less detestable or maybe a lot less detestable than other people that we've seen in life. No, but because Jesus has taken our detestableness upon himself and got rid of it at the cross and replaced it, replaced it with his Righteousness, his perfectness. And with that, and declaring that to be the truth, writing our names in his book of life. Now, if God would give us the opportunity to, high definition, uh, camera, to look very closely at that book of life and, and to see the, the names written there, um, you, would, you would see his name. You would see your name. It is there. How can we be sure that this new home is ours? How can we be sure that our name is written there? How can we be sure that, yeah, this incredible joy will replace what we experience here on earth? Well, we come back to the idea of Jesus' Easter victory. He's victorious, therefore we are victorious. It really comes back to that Easter declaration. This is our new home. We know it is. Our names are written there. We know they are because Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen. Amen.
Now may the God of hope fill us with all joy and peace as we trust in him. Amen. Let us together confess our faith in this, uh, our Savior God, the Triune God. The Apostles' Creed is on page 7 of the service program. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Lord, hear my prayer. Listen to my cry for mercy. In their faithfulness and righteousness, come to my relief. Spare us, Lord, from the lies of the devil and the attacks of our conscience. Comfort and save us in your patient compassion. Have mercy on us, Jesus. Guide us, Lord, to the wisdom of your word and the power of your promises. Take away our confusion and doubt. Have mercy on us, Jesus. Hear us, Lord, when we come to you in prayer. Make us confident to take you at your word and to follow you in faith. Empower us, Lord, to walk in your ways and live in your truth. Fill us with your love that we may love you and one another. O oh Lord God, Lord of life and death, we thank you for all the mercies with which you blessed our fellow believers, Sally Bailey and Al Lindner, now fallen asleep. We thank you especially for having brought them to the knowledge of your Son, Jesus Christ. We pray that you would comfort their families and all who mourn their deaths with your, with your precious promises and cheer them with the sure hope of a blessed reunion in heaven. Grant the lifeless bodies rest and at last, together with us all, a joyful resurrection to life everlasting. Teach us to number our days aright, that we may gain hearts of wisdom and finally be saved through Jesus Christ, our risen and ever-living Lord. Amen. O oh God, you are the giver of everything good. Inspire us, your humble servants, to long for what is right and, through your gracious guidance, accomplish it to your glory. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Almighty and merciful God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless us and keep us. Amen. Amen. Please be seated for the closing hymn verses. They are on page nine. Two closing verses from a, a newer hymn, which actually is a very old hymn, new to us, but beautiful verses about the home that Jesus will bring us to. Um. 